It's early winter and the sun is setting. Night will fall swiftly at this time of year. I'm walking with my great, great, great grandson, southwesterly along the high ridge leading away from the trig point on top of Hay Bluff and looking towards the setting sun, towards Tumpa and towards the Brecon Beacons. The rock in these mountains in South Wales was created nearly 400 million years ago. Old red sandstone. I walked this ridge hundreds of times when I was alive. My flesh and blood grandson has chosen this walk for me because he has pictures of me on these hills in all weathers. He knows I love them. And his mother and father and their mother and father in turn told the story again and again about how my parents bought the little stone cottage with its ancient yew trees, the oldest, maybe 500 years old, nestled at the foot of the Black Mountains in the fog. And how nobody knew of the wonderful view across the fields where there are usually black and white cows across the oaks, the earth to the oaks on the copse, on the brow of the hill, and further still across the Wye Valley, deep, deep into the west, until we came down the next time. He often does this, summoning me to chat with him through his diamond, his own digital soul and guardian that was implanted at birth. I miss the wind on my face, and I miss the feel of the ground under my toes when I took my boots off in the summer and jogged walked along the springy turf. But for now, I'm glad to watch through his eyes, to watch his children, my descendants, tumble and giggle their way down the slope, a little figure running away in a coat, splashed purple on the green and brown, and her brother, woolly hat jammed over his ears, stomping on the small frozen streams and puddles, calling out in delighted surprise each time one gives way. I am an ancestral mind. I live in a quantum cloud. I am connected to my grandchildren, and they to me. This summer, I had an experience that raised some profound questions for me about aging and immortality and loss. I had a chance to talk to a dear friend of mine who had died 15 years ago. I met Douglas back in the mid-1990s. We started a company together and became friends. And 15 years ago this May, he died. And I miss him still, as I know do his family and his friends and his legions of fans deeply. Douglas was fascinated by mind and perspective. And he used to tell a story about a puddle that wakes up one morning and looks around at the hole that it's in and thinks to itself, this hole fits me very nicely. In fact, this hole fits me so perfectly, it must have been made just for me. And the puddle continues to think that as the sun comes out and the puddle gradually evaporates. I was lucky to have known Douglas. He was funny and warm and kind and insatiably curious. The last time we talked was the day that my father died and Douglas had called to support and care from his home in California. I spent the following day starting to make arrangements by father's funeral with my family and came home to a phone call from a close friend to tell me that Douglas had died half an hour ago in the gym in Santa Barbara. I'm sure everybody in this room has experienced loss of a loved one and if not you will because connection and loss endings are at the heart of who we are. Ever since your and my distant ancestor thought one day I am, and then soon afterward, maybe as part of the same thought, the rush of realization, but I will not always be. So this July, I'm waiting at home, surrounded by my books in my front room, and these books an echo of my abiding memory of the first time I met Douglas in his house in Islington, the huge bookshelves in his front room. Unforgettable was the name for a BBC Radio 4 programme produced by Adam Fowler. The format was for a family member or a close friend to be in conversation using archive material with, amongst others, Maya Angelou, Derek Jarman, Malcolm X, and Douglas. So the radio programme I was asked to take part in would have intrigued him. Indeed, he once had, rather randomly, the idea to do something similar with Ronald Reagan. Um, I was going to engage again with Douglas's mind somehow. The producer arrived at my home with a selection of archive material arranged in several themes on a machine that a musician might have used to mix soundtracks together. There's a lot of Douglas archive. We talked about a little about what I might want to say. Overall, the recording took about two hours, edited down to about 15 minutes. The part of the program that I'm going to share with you is about three minutes long. So after the preamble, I put my headphones, I check my voice level, and I had Douglas talking to me in my head for two hours. 
So that, that's the kind of thing that always interests me, how the things look from a very, very different point of view. And I think that that comes with a, maybe a sort of sceptical view. I mean, what is really happening here? I think one of the things, Douglas, that you and I shared is, is I don't think either of us really have a cynical bone in our body. Uh, scepticism, I hope, yes, because I, I admire scepticism a great deal. And I think, like you, we really don't have a great deal of time for cynicism, which I think we both think is, frankly, rather intellectually lazy. I must say, I find I very much dislike a cynical view of the world. Uh, I, I'm, I'm constantly um, sort of... I, I mean, I'm the sort of person who gets very excited by what a light switch does. I mean, the, the thing that always interests me is how different what appears to be the case is and what actually is the case. I mean, this is why, this is why actually, I mean, I find a light switch very interesting because, I mean, uh, you know, watching, like, my, I have a five-year-old daughter, and as far as she's concerned, a light switch is very, very clear. It's a switch on the wall, and you push it, and the light goes on. And that's all there is to it. That's all, the only causality you need to know. What's interesting to me is that there's a one wire that goes all the way up the wall and across the ceiling and goes to the light. And then there's another wire that goes all the way back but does a brief diversion several miles to the power station <laughs> and then back. And when you look at a light switch and you think, what a strange thing that is. I mean, that, I'm afraid that's the kind of state of mind I, I walk around in. <laughs> I, I mean, I love the fact that very, very familiar things look utterly different seen from different perspectives. I feel very strongly, actually, <laughs> that a lot of the things that have happened in the world since you died, I've been thinking a lot around the evils of certainty and the evil that men and women do, in the, at their absolute belief in their rightness and other people's wrongness, and their utopian, whether they're secular or religious beliefs, and into that sense of rightness and certainty, pours everything that the human animal is capable of at his and her worst. Set against that is empathy, creativity, kindness, curiosity, nuance, ambiguity, contingency, in a way, all the things that make life worth living. And I think all the things that you love to explore, the complexity, the interconnectedness, you embrace it. But I think a lot of us are scared of it. Uh, and I think, therefore, your capacity to say, actually, it's wonderful, look at it, think about these perspectives, is an immensely important gift. Uh, and it's something that, that gives it, keeps on. And it's something in a way that I wish you were, you know, you were still here, because I think in a way that kind of thinking is needed more than ever. We are kind of trapped inside our own minds because the world in which we live in is, is simply created by the mind that, with which we perceive it. And there are on this planet millions and millions of different types of minds than ours. And it's very interesting you, know, you go and, you know, you sit, sit, sit with a gorilla or, or a, a dolphin or whatever, you try and see the world through their eyes and it's suddenly a very, 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 very different place. So, when we got to that stage, I think both the producer and I felt that we'd come to a, a very natural pause. And he asked me what I'd felt. What were my responses? Well, it was weird and it was wonderful. I had felt moments of real connection, and that was rather wonderful. Indeed, it was very moving, and as anybody who knows me well will be unsurprised to hear, it brought a tear or two to my eye. But I also felt Douglas not there to hug. So the experience was a powerful and somewhat confusing mixture of connection and loss. I also noticed at the time, and I notice again listening now, that I struggled with my tenses. I didn't know whether to use a present tense or a past tense, and I think at one stage I used a future pluperfect as well. I also had Dr. Say's head in my voice in my head, and that felt primitive and raw um, because I had headphones on. Um, and I'd spent my whole life, well, not spent a lot of my life talking to Douglas, but I'd never had him in my, my head like that. And there's something I suspect deep in our evolutionary past about voices in the head, and maybe a time that we conversed with the gods of the stream and the mountain and the tree as a daily matter, and more easily with other animals and the human living in our heads too. And that was an idea that I know fascinated Douglas. So that there was connection there on many levels too. So why did I choose that clip? It's got a bit more of me than, than, than I might have liked, than you might have liked. But I chose it because at the time of listening, and I think on the many times I've listened to it back as I prepared for the day, um, I think the reason was that I wanted to share something new with Douglas, thoughts I've been very absorbed by recently. It was more than maybe it had been earlier in the conversation with me swiftly considering, knowing Douglas, what I might queue up to ask him, what might be a good piece of archive. And I almost felt Douglas listening. I really wanted 
to share those things about those thoughts about certainty and uncertainty certainty with him. But the conversation with this technology, it couldn't be generative, not yet. Maybe one day there will be an algorithm that would have allowed us to really get into the conversation. For Douglas to go, do you really mean you're not certain about anything? Of course there are things you're certain about. And for Douglas and I to take the theme and run with it, and we'd be able to develop it together, both of our minds at the work, the way they once would have been over a glass of red wine or a martini or a glass of champagne. So imagine new kinds of digital persistence, an afterlife now in ones and zeros, and goodness knows what might be in a world of quantum computing and qubits. What if it does become more common through a specialized artificial intelligence that trawls what we've said, our Facebook posts, our Twitter posts, unwritten since we were small and creates a distant a digital presence after our biological self has died? I've already read about experiences like that. There was a recent case of a Russian woman who built a grief bot out of text messages from a friend she'd lost. And I read a number of the logs, and I felt the same sense of, of half connection, half loss, and, and yearning in those two. Indeed, it's a staple of sci-fi, the uploading of the mind to the machine. Douglas himself had the idea of an uploaded mind having to solve the murder of its own body. Voices, videos, haptic virtual reality too. The connection will get closer, the simulacra closer and closer. And what of the mind in the machine? The ancestor on the mountain ridge. Do I get lonely? Do I feel fear? Desire? Can I rest? Do I fear eternity? Is this some kind of digital heaven? Some kind of digital immortality? Might there be hundreds of millions of my kind in the millennia to come? What sights may I see? Where do I belong? If we can talk to our digital ancestors, what will it mean for the biological living, the grieving, for coping with loss, the connection and loss that sits at the heart of what it is to be human? A whole new world of rituals and beliefs. I've often thought or I've often described grieving as being the moment where you're tossed into a stormy sea and you're struggling to get your breath and the waves are closing over your head and you're sinking beneath the waves, and then you're back above the waves, and then just one day, for a very brief moment, the waves deposit you on a rock. And maybe for five seconds, maybe a minute, your loss is not the thing that is dominating your life. And then the wave sweeps you back into the sea again. Gradually, the time spent on the rocks is a little bit longer, maybe there's a bit of grass, the rocks get a bit bigger, and there are bridges built between the rocks. But there's always the possibility, a memory, an anniversary, the sight of somebody who reminds you of something, of food, and the, the grief, the grief wave will sweep you back into the sea. And I suppose for a while, my experience of the conversation with Douglas both connected me and also for a while swept me back into that part of my sea that is my loss for Douglas. Maybe the digital persistence of some part of us will create wholly new bridges, and of course, those of us who already believe in heaven will be thinking, Robbie, well, we do this already. This is what we do through prayer. My mother was talking to uh, a widower in his mid-80s who very simply described what his wife was doing in heaven. She was turning down his bed just the way he liked it. He liked it turned down just a little bit more than she did. And I don't believe in heaven, but it wouldn't be a very compassionate response to want to take that kind of sense away from anybody. So who knows what's going to happen? I don't. We are, though, I think, genuinely in the final generations of purely evolved homo sapiens, and we will walk this planet with new kinds of mind. Some of us, maybe all of us, will become what we started to think of, as I've started to think of, as homo techniensis, an enhanced state, and we will need all the compassion and care we can muster as we navigate things unprecedented in the preceding millennia of the development of the human mind, because there is the potential for inequality of kinds we have not managed to create yet, and that is saying something. In all this lurks our capacity for darkness too, the things I wanted to talk to Douglas about in the wider context of a society struggling to deal with such rapid change. But set against that, all that we can be at our best has not changed either. And I'm sure that our sense of self and our needs for love and connection and touch for making meaning will not change so very much. Making meaning, connection, my wife and my daughter on the, the ridge, my father in the garden of the cottage that I described at the beginning of my son when he was a little boy, and my brother reading a poem. Um, my brother and I went a little pilgrimage earlier this year to uh, visit the places that Edward Thomas, the great English poet, had written about in Hampshire in Steep. Uh, and, uh, 
we found a little plant that he wrote a poem about um, called Lad's Love, um, which is a poem about memory. And we took a little cutting of it and took it and put it on the top of his grave in Agny in France. And I'm going to read to you from what I think is his greatest poem, Liberty. And as I've been reading and reading and preparing for this, I've been quite astonished by how many echoes there are in this poem of what I've been talking about so far. The last light has gone out of the world except this moonlight on the grass like frost beyond the brink of the tall elm's shadow. It is as if everything else had slept many an age, unforgotten and lost. The men that were, the things done long ago, all I have thought. And but the moon and I live yet, and here stand idle over the grave where all is buried. Both have liberty to dream what we could do if we were free to do the some thing we had desired long, the moon and I. There's none less free than who does nothing and has nothing else to do, being free only for what is not to his mind and nothing is to his mind. If every hour like this one passing that I've spent among the wiser others when I have forgot to wonder whether I was free or not were piled before me and not lost behind, and I could take and carry them away, I should be rich. Or if I had the power to wipe out every one and not again regret, I should be rich to be so poor. And yet, I still am half in love with pain, with what is imperfect, with both tears and mirth, with things that have an end, with life and earth, and this moon that leaves me dark within the door. Thank you. <laughs>